Chapter 11, in which Kazul is unwell and Simrine makes a new acquaintance. Alianora decided to return home by way of the path outside instead of through the tunnels because it was such a nice day and she hoped the sun would dry her skirt. Simrine watched her go, swinging her basket happily and humming a little, her confidence and good humor completely restored by the possession of the fat little packet of dried feverfew in her pocket. I wish I had as little to worry about, Simrine muttered, thinking of Warug and the wizards. She held the burned patch at the end of her sleeve up to get a better look at it in the sunlight and shook her head. Even the magic wardrobe would have a hard time fixing that. A puff of wind made her shiver in her wet clothes, and she turned to go back into the cave to change. A dark shadow fell over Kazimarine, and she stopped and looked up. Kazool, she said, as the dragon landed on the open path beside her. Am I glad to see you. Wait until you hear what's been happening. You do appear to have had a rather strenuous day, Kazool said, eyeing Simrine's wet stained skirt and the blackened end of her right sleeve. Nothing serious, I trust. I'm not sure, Simrine said. Alianora and I went out to pick some fever few, and we ran into that wizard Antarell. Where was this? Simrine pointed. Up that way, there's a little round valley off to one side that looks as if the dragons never go there, and you found a wizard there? Kazool sounded deeply disturbed. How did he get in? How did you get in? We climbed through a crack in a boulder, Simrine said. I don't know how Antarell did it. When we, he left, he was heading for the far side of the valley. This is serious, Kazool said, getting to her feet. I'd better warn the king. He'll have to use the crystal now. You'd better hear the rest of it first, Simrine said. Antarell wasn't too happy to see us, but when he found out that Alianora was Warug's princess, he relaxed. He seemed to think that Warug had sent us. What? Simrine involuntarily stepped back a pace at the anger in Kazul's voice. He thought Warug had sent us, she repeated, and gave a quick summary of her conversation with Antarell. Warug. Kazul's tail lashed, sweeping a small boulder from one side of the path to the other. But Warug's not a fool, and only a fool would let a wizard into that valley, unless he was sure that they didn't know what was Antarell doing. Cutting plants, Simrine said, or rather, cutting a plant. It didn't look as if he took more than one. He wouldn't need more than one if it was the right one, Kazul said tensely. What did he pick? It was a prickly-looking purple thing with saw-edged leaves, Simmering said, reaching into her pocket. I didn't recognize it, but I thought you might, so I brought a piece back for you to look. What? Kazul roared. Flames spurted from the dragon's mouth, enveloping Simmering. Steam hissed from her wet skirt, and the thinner material of her sleeves vanished in a crackle of sparks. The handkerchief-wrapped spray of purple leaves, which she had just taken out of her pocket to show Kazul, disintegrated into a dark, greasy-looking cloud of smoke. Simrine stared at the ashes in her palm, feeling very, very glad that she had decided to test the way, for, the fever, the way fresh fever few would work in the fireproofing spell. She felt a little warm, and her clothes had been reduced to a few charred rags, but that was nothing compared to what might have happened. Now I understand why Alianora ran out of fever few, she muttered. A puff of wind brushed Simrine's arms, and she heard a choking sound from Kazool. She looked up, expecting to find the dragon laughing at her remark, and her eyes widened. Kazool's head was thrown back, and her mouth was wide open, giving Simrine an excellent view of the dragon's sharp silver teeth and long red tongue. Simrine skipped backward out of reach. Then she realized that the dragon was gasping for air. Kazool, what's the matter? The smoke, Kazool coughed. Her voice was so hoarse that it was hard for Simrine to understand what she was saying. What can I do? Simrine said, trying not to feel frightened. Green jar, shelf in last treasure room, Kazul managed between coughs. Hurry! Simrine was already running through the mouth of the cave as fast as her feet could carry her. She did not even pause as she reached, as she snatched up her lamp from the floor just inside the door. It seemed to take forever to get through the twisty passages and the first two caves full of treasure. She skidded to a halt in the doorway of the third room and stood panting, scanning the walls for the shelf and the right jar. She found it quickly and ran back at once, the jar clutched tightly in her right hand. The sound of Kazul's coughing grew louder as Simrine sped back the way she had come. At the mouth of the cave, Simrine paused and set down the lamp, then unscrewed the top of the green jar. Inside was a thick emerald-colored liquid, about the consistency of honey. She looked out at Kazul. The dragon's head jerked with each cough, and the scales on her neck were beginning to turn pink around the edges. For a long, careful moment, Simrine studied Kazul's movements. Then she leaned back and threw the emerald liquid, jar and all, into the dragon's open mouth, just as Kazul took another gasping breath. The jar landed on Kazul's tongue. The dragon's mouth closed, and she swallowed convulsively. Suddenly, a sudden silence descended. Are you all right now? Simrine asked after Kazul had taken several deep breaths without a renewed bout of coughing. I will be, Kazul said. She sounded exhausted, and her movements as she slid into the cave were slow and uncertain. 
What happened? Simran said, backing out of the way so Kazul would not even would not have to exert herself to go around. I got a breath of the smoke when the plant in your hand burned, Kazil said as she settled to the floor just inside the entrance. Lucky it was only a breath. I'll need a few days of rest, but that's better than being dead. Simrine stared at her, appalled. What was that plant? Dragon's bane, said Kazul, her eyes closed, and she slept. Kazul continued to sleep for most of the next three days. She woke only long enough for Simrine to pour a couple of gallons of warm milk mixed with honey down her throat from time to time before she lapsed back into unconsciousness. Simrin was very worried, but there wasn't much that she could do. Sick dragons are too large and heavy for normal nursing to be of much use. On the afternoon of the third day, Kazul woke up completely for the first time since her collapse. Thank goodness, said Simrin, as Kazul shook her head experimentally and, sh and sat up. I was beginning to think you were going to sleep for a month. I might have if I'd gotten more than a whiff of that smoke. Kazul stretched her neck in one direction and her tail in the other, trying to work out some of the kinks. If I'd known it was so dangerous, I'd never have brought any of that purple plant back with me, Simrine apologized. You might have done worse than sleep for a month. You might have, she stopped, unwilling to complete the thought. I might have died, Kazil said. Unlikely. If a dragon isn't killed outright by something in the first five minutes, recovery is only a matter of time. That applies as much to Dragon's Bane as to a knight's magic sword. Then why did you want that goo in the green jar, Simrine asked. The antidote? I wanted it because I don't like the <laughs> I didn't like the idea of spending a month recuperating when I didn't have to. And since a fit of coughing interrupted Kazula mid sense sentence. Simrine skip, skipped backward out of the way. Frowning worriedly, she tossed a pinch of fever fuel into the air and recited the verse from the fireproofing spell in case Kazul should lose control of her flame again. Maybe you won't need a month to recover, but three days obviously isn't enough, she said to the dragon. You'd better lie back down before you choke. I can't, Kazul said. I have to warn the king. If the wizards have had a dragon's bane for three days already, she started coughing again and had to stop talking. You stay here, Simrin said in a firm tone. I'll warn the king. Tokaz won't listen to you, Kazul said, but she started. But she settled back to the ground. Roxham will, though. Start with him. Roxham? Simrin said doubtfully. She was afraid the gray-green dragon would want to go charging out after the wizards as soon as he had heard they were up to something. He'll listen to you, and the king will listen to him, Kazul said. It's not ideal, but it's the best we can do. All right, I'll go see Roxham. You stay here and sleep. When you get back, I'll wake you and tell you what he said, Simrine promised. Now, go to sleep. Kazul smiled slightly and closed her eyes. Simrine caught up a lamp and almost ran to the exit at the back of the cave. She was afraid that Kazul would think of something else and start talking again, and she didn't think talking would be good for her. In the tunnel outside, Simrine paused, trying to remember the directions to Roxham's cave. She had memorized a map of, in the library that showed most of the twists and turns of the dragon's tunnels. But she knew from experience that in the miles of gray stone corridors, it was difficult to keep track of where she was. Left, left, fifth right, past the little chamber, right again, on past the iron gate, two lefts to the third cave down, she muttered to herself. I wish Roxham's cave were closer. Still muttering, she started off. Though she was being very careful, Simrine had to backtrack twice during the first part of her trip when a mistake in counting corridors led her to a dead end. When she finally saw the iron gate that led into the Caves of Fire and Night, she sighed in relief. The tricky part was over, and the rest of the trip would be easy. She held her lamp up and quickened her step, hoping to make up some of the time she had lost on her detours. Then, as she reached the bars that blocked the entrance to the Caves of Fire and Night, she stopped short. There was someone sitting on the ground on the other side of the gate. Serene had almost missed seeing him, and no wonder his clothes, though well cut, were the same dark gray as the stone of the tunnel walls, and he was curled into a lumpy, dejected ball. He looked like a large rock. If he hadn't moved his hand as she passed, Serene would never have realized he was alive. The man on the other side of the bars raised his head, and Serene saw with shock that his hair and skin were the same dark, even gray as his clothes. His eyes, too, were gray, and their expression was apologetic. Forgive me for startling you, the man said, climbing ponderously to his feet. I didn't see you coming. He made a stiff, formal bow. Who are you? Simrine demanded, and what are you doing in there? I'm a prince, the man said in a gloomy tone, and I'm reaping the rewards of my folly. What folly? The prince sighed. It's a long story. Somehow they always seem to be long, Simrine said. You haven't come to rescue me from the dragons, have you? Because if you have, I'm not going to let you out of, out of there. I haven't got time to spend an hour arguing today. 
I have no interest whatever in dragons, I assure you, the prince said earnestly, and if you would let me out, I would be extremely grateful. Um, who are you, by the way? Simreen, princess of the dragon Kazul, Simreen said. She studied the prince for a moment and decided that he looked trustworthy. All right, I'll let you out. Turn around and put your fingers in your ears. What? the prince said, looking considerably startled. It's part of the spell to open the gate, Simreen said. She wasn't about to let him overhear the words Kazul had used to unlock the door, even if he did look trustworthy. The prince shrugged and did as she directed. Quickly, Simreen recited, By night in flame and shining rock, open thou thy hidden lock, Alberolingarn. For an instant, nothing happened, and Simreen was afraid she had not remembered the charm correctly. Then the iron gate swung silently open. The prince, whose back was to the gate, did not notice. Simreen touched his shoulder to get his attention, and her eyes widened. Oh, she said as he turned, you're, you're stone. I know, the prince said. It's part of that long story I mentioned earlier. I haven't gotten used to it yet. He stepped through the gate, and it closed noiselessly behind him. I'm afraid I don't have time to listen to stories just now, Simreen said politely. I have a rather urgent errand to run, so if you'll excuse me. Can't I come with you? Simreen stared at him. Why do you want to do that? The stone prince looked down at his feet with an embarrassed expression. Um, well, actually, I'm lost, and you seem to know your way around down here. He glanced hopefully at Simreen's face, then sighed. I suppose I can just wander around some more. I'll have to find a way out eventually. You'll run into a dragon and get eaten. I don't think it will hurt stone, the prince said. He sounded almost cheerful, as if he had only just realized that being made of stone might have some advantages. Maybe not, but you're sure to give the dragon indigestion, Simreen said. Father, I don't have time for this. I could wait here if you're coming back this way, the stone prince suggested. Simreen brightened, then frowned and shook her head. No, one of the dragons might need to get into the caves of fire and night, or it might be the turn of those dratted wizards. You can't stay here. Then, I know. You can wait in the serving room, just off the banquet hall, Simreen said. It's close, there's plenty of room, and there's and I know no one is using it today because I checked the schedule for Alianora yesterday. I can take a shortcut out the back to get to Roxham's without losing any more time. Come on. I really appreciate this, the stone prince said as they started off. You don't know what it's like being lost in the dark in, the cave, in these caves. How did it happen? Simreen asked. The stone prince's expression became gloomy once more. It's all that soothsayer's fault, he said. Soothsayer? My father didn't think it was appropriate to invite fairies to a prince's christening, so he invited a soothsayer instead, the prince replied. The soothsayer took one look at me and said that I would grow up to do a great service for a king. I have been stuck with his blasted prophecy ever since. It doesn't sound so terrible to me, Simreen said. It wasn't at first, the stone prince admitted. I had special tutors and all sorts of interesting things to prepare me for being of great service to a king. My father even sent me to a special school for people who are supposed to do special things. Did you do well? I was the top of my class, the stone prince said with a flash of pride. His face fell again. That's part of the problem. I don't understand, Simri said. This way, and can you walk a little faster, please? I'm in a hurry. It's been three years since I graduated, and everyone's still waiting for me to do something spectacular, the stone prince said, lengthening his stride. The rest of my classmates are already making names for themselves. George started killing dragons right away, and Art went straight home and pulled some sort of magic sword out of a, out of a rock. Even the ones nobody expected to amount to much have done something. All Jack wanted to do was go back to his mother's farm and raise beans, and he ended up stealing a magic harp and killing a giant and all sorts of things. I'm the only one who hasn't succeeded. Why not? The stone prince sighed again. I don't know. At first it seemed as if I wouldn't have any trouble finding a king to serve. Every time there was a war, both kings asked me to lead their armies, and every king for miles around who'd lost his throne to a, us to a usurper sent a, s a messenger to my father's court. It should have been simple. Only they were always so worried about whether I was going to side with their enemies that it was easier not to pick anyone. I see, said Simmering. Privately, she thought that the Stone Prince had been rather wishy-washy. Some of her opinion must have crept into her tone because the Stone Prince nodded glumly. You're right. It was a mistake. As long as I didn't pick a king to serve, all the messengers and ambassadors and envoys stayed, hoping to persuade me. The inns around the castle were stuffed with them. It got to the point where I couldn't show my face without at least three of them pouncing on me. Finally, I couldn't stand it any more, and I ran away. It was a relief at first, not having, ever, not having everyone hovering over me waiting for me to do something great. But after a while, I started to feel uncomfortable. Then I realized that even if nobody around me expected me to do something special in the service of a king, I expected me to do something. 
I was so flustered that I ran up to the next palace I saw and asked whether the king needed any services done. It turned out that he was ill, and his doctors had told him that the only thing that would cure him was a drink of the water of healing from the caves of fire and night. So I left to get it done. I left to get it at once. So that's why you, what you were doing, Simrin said. The stone prince gave her another gloomy nod. I should have known better. That king had three sons, and the first two had already gone off to get the water and failed. Anyone with sense would have seen that the youngest son was the only one who, could, who would succeed. It sticks out all over. But I was too eager to, go, to do my great service and get it over with, and I didn't stop and think. What happened? It took me a long time to find the caves of fire and night, but once I did, it wasn't hard to find the water of healing. The chamber's getting crowded. All the princes who've tried to get the water and failed have been turned into slabs of rock. I know, I've seen them, Simrain said. Watch out for your head, the ceiling is low along here. Then you know what it's like, and you've seen the two dippers on the wall by the spring. The stone prince's shoulder sagged. I knew I should use the tin one. It was one of the first things we learned at school, but I thought it wouldn't do any harm if I just looked at the gold one. So I took it up off the wall, and as soon as I touched it, I started to stiffen up. Mmm, said Simri. The stone prince was obviously well aware of how foolish he had been be or he had behaved. She saw no reason to make him feel more feel worse by pointing it out to him again. So I stuck my arm in the spring, the prince said. You stuck your arm? Oh, I see. That was clever, Simrine said. Do you really think so? the stone prince asked, seriously. I thought that since the water from the prince's spring is going to turn all the slabs of stone back into princes when somebody finally succeeds in the quest, then the water ought to keep me from turning into a slab of stone in the first place. Only it didn't work the way I expected. He finished dis 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 disconsolately. I can see that, Simrine said. But at least you can still do things. It would be much worse to have to lie there waiting for the right prince to come along and break the spell. I wouldn't have had to lie there very long, the stone prince said. That king's youngest son is going to arrive any day now. I just know it. Anyway, if I were a slab of stone, I wouldn't know about it until it was all over and I'd been turned back into a prince again. How do you know? Simmering demanded. Have you ever been a stone slab? The stone prince looked startled. No, I haven't. I never thought of that. Well, start thinking now, Simmering said tartly. Here's the service room. Wait here for me, and don't go wandering off if I'm, a late, if I'm late getting back. I don't know how long this errand is going to take, and it would be very awkward for me if the dragons found you roaming through, the, roaming through their tunnels. I'll remember, the stone prince promised, but what do I do if someone comes in? Duck into the banquet area, Simrine said, showing him. And if someone comes in there too, curl up in the corner and pretend you're a rock. All right, the prince said doubtfully. Simrine did not like leaving him, but she was even less enthusiastic about taking him to see Roxham. Roxham probably wouldn't object to the prince himself, though Simrine suspected there might have been some difficulty over his proposed theft of the water of healing. But explaining everything to the gray-green dragon would take hours. Roxham was nice, but he tended to take a simple view of things, and the prince's situation was anything but simple. So Simrine gave the prince one more warning, just to make sure he understood, and started off toward Roxham's cave to finish her errand.